Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Southern Africa Food Security Outlook Briefing for October 2022 to May 2023 period. I'm Benjamin Davies, a Senior Food Security Analyst at FuseNet, and I'm joined by Elizabeth Calderon, also a Senior Food Security Analyst, and Mikhail Tefasalasi, a Food Security Analyst, and they will both be presenting later on in the presentation. Today, we'll go through a brief overview of FuseNet's analytical, analytical approach, the key messages, the current situation across the region, the assumptions through May 2023, and go into more detail on our area areas of concern, Malawi and Southern Madagascar. FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis uses the scenario development methodology. First, we set our scenario parameters for our most likely scenario, then we collect available primary and secondary data to understand the current drivers of food insecurity and classify current food insecurity outcomes. We then develop key assumptions for our most likely scenario and use those assumptions to understand how they will impact household income and food sources to describe and classify projected household food insecurity. We then use the IPC 3.0 scale, which I'll describe in the next slide, to classify area level food insecurity outcomes. And finally, we identify events that could change FuseNet's most likely scenario. This is the IPC 3.0 area level phase classification scale. There are five phases with phase one being minimal and phase five being famine. For an area to be classified in a phase, at least 20% of the population must be classified at that phase as demonstrated in the bottom half of the slide. In phase three, households start facing food consumption gaps or begin engaging in unsustainable coping strategies. For phase three and higher, humanitarian food assistance is needed to protect livelihoods and fill food consumption gaps. We donate um, an exclamation point in our mapping where phase classification would likely be at least one phase worse without current or programmed humanitarian assistance. In our remote monitoring countries, the country phase classification is determined by the worst area level classification within that country. Now looking to the seasonal calendar, for a typical year, we are currently at the beginning of the summer and the main planting season, along with the start of the lean season in November through March. The wheat harvest across the region is underway, along with planting for the upcoming 2022-2023 agricultural season. As we look towards the end of the outlook period, the main harvest is expected to begin in April and will remain through the end of the outlook period in May. It should also be noted that in the DRC, the cassava harvest is ongoing year round. Looking at the key messages um, across the region, uh, with the start of the lean season, many poor households are increasingly reliant on markets for food, but high global commodity prices and inflation are limiting household purchasing power. Well above average staple food prices are also likely to be maintained throughout the outlook period due to elevated transport costs, high global commodity prices, exchange rate volatility, and international supply chain disruptions. In October, maize prices um, have been increasing seasonally across most markets and remain above prices last year in the five-year average due to declining stock-to-use ratios and strong export demand to East Africa. Conflict also remains a major driver of acute food insecurity in parts of DRC and Mozambique, where households continue to be displaced and household livelihood and market activities are disrupted. Across most of Southern Africa, average to above average rainfall is supporting crop planting at the start of the agricultural season. However, an erratic start of rainfall in Malawi and northern Mozambique is likely delaying planting, but rainfall is forecast to improve in 2023. Overall, crisis IPC phase three outcomes are expected across most, most of the region um, until, until at least March in areas where there was poor production in 2022 and households are market reliant. However, emergency IPC phase four outcomes are expected in southwestern areas of Madagascar in 2023 in the absence of humanitarian assistance. Moving now to the current situation. In 2022, some of the key shocks included the increase in annual inflation as seen in the graphic on the left and the poor 2022 harvest following prolonged dry spells in Southern Africa as highlighted by the Crop Water Requirement Satisfa Satisfaction Index, WRSI map, um, which this graphic is showing at the start of the 2022 harvest in March. In this map, the brown and orange colors are indicating areas that likely recorded poor to failed maize harvests due to not having enough mo moisture. 
However, I'll note that the WRSI map does not capture areas where damage from cyclones or tropical storms resulted in below average har harvest. Now, looking at some of the macroeconomic drivers across the region, uh, macroeconomic conditions remain mixed and largely higher than last year. And this is shown, as I mentioned on the chart on the left, with annual inflation rates from November 2021 to October or November 2022. On the right axis is the annual inflation rate for Zimbabwe, the, which is in yellow, while the annual inflation rate for the rest of the region is on the left. Overall, annual inflation is higher than last year, with the resulting high prices likely limiting household purchasing power in a region where many poor households are typically market reliant, particularly during the lean season. In Angola, which is denoted by the red line, headline inflation continues to follow a downward trend, decreasing from 21% in July to about 16.5% in November 2022. However, during the same five-month period, the value of the Kwanzaa to the US, US dollar has declined by 20%. Therefore, although annual inflation, the annual inflation rate is declining, domestic prices are rising, albeit at a slower monthly inflation rate. In Madagascar, which is the purple line, inflation climbed to a, about 10.5% year-on-year in September 2022, which is the highest inflation rate recorded since January 2018. The increase in inflation is driven by high fuel and transportation costs, as well as high food prices, reflecting international prices as well as domestic damage to crops caused by weather events such as cyclones and drought. The increasing inflation is eroding household purchasing power and limiting access to food. In Zimbabwe, the yellow line, annual inflation is declining due to recent macroeconomic stabilization and declining prices for some food commodities and services in both US dollars and Zimbabwean dollars, largely due to a series of government interventions in the, in the past few months. Nevertheless, prices remain above average given high fuel, utility, and transportation costs, among other drivers. The very high inflation and ongoing macroeconomic issues are also keeping food prices high. In Malawi, which is the green line, inflation has risen steeply from 10% in October 2021 to about 27% in October 2022, linked to weaker export revenues, high global food and fuel prices, and the devaluation of the Malawi kwacha in May, uh, which is constraining household access to food for both rural and urban populations. In the DRC, the black line, annual inflation is rising, driving, driven by a depreciation in the local currency and high fuel and transportation costs. And lastly, in Mozambique, the gray line and South Africa, the orange line, annual inflation is a little more stable, but still higher than last year, driven by high commodity fuel and transportation costs. Looking at maize prices across the region, uh, the current prices, which is the green line, are largely above prices last year, which is shown by the orange dots, and the five-year average, which are the tan columns. In the top left, uh, white maize prices in South Africa increased by 9% in October to their highest level since 2016, driven by high international prices and increased export demand following Kenya's lifting of a ban of GMO imports. In Malawi, the top right, Maize prices increase seasonally, driven by poor harvest, depreciation of the local currency, and disruptions to the operations of the National Grain Marketing Board. And in Zimbabwe, which is shown in the bottom, maize grain prices are well above prices last year and increase seasonally as stocks decline, especially in deficit areas. Um, and in general, while the lean season has started, um, the maize supply is favorable across the region. Although there are some areas where we are seeing subnational and national market shortages, um, notably this is in the conflict-affected areas of the DRC in Mozambique, and in drought-affected areas of southern Madagascar, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Looking at another key driver of acute food insecurity in the region, um, which is conflict, um, particularly in the DRC in Mozambique, in both of these areas, um, the long-lasting conflict has had a number of impacts including reducing household access to livelihood assets due to pillaging, lower market functions, impeding access to fields for crop production, creating difficult conditions for the delivery of humanitarian food assistance, and displacement of the local population. In the DRC, there are over 5.5 million registered IDPs, with over 
um, located in Ituri and North and South Kivu. Looking at the graphic on the right, this is showing the, the number of conflict inf incidents in the DRC from January 2020 to November 2022, with Ituri in blue, North Kivu orange, and South Kivu gray, and the rest of the country in yellow. As you can see, these three areas account for most of the conflict events in the DRC. In more recent months, the upsurge in, vi in violence related to the M23 rebellion in North Kivu has led to the displacement of over 370,000 people, particularly in Rushuru and Niragongo territories of North Kivu. Um, I will also note that in the DRC, we are currently at the peak of the lean season, following a below average production from season A and B in 2022, driven by low access to fields because of population displacement. Looking at Mozambique, the IOM still estimates that there are just under 1 million IDPs in Cabo Delgado, but households are beginning to return to their, to their places of origin or are moving in search of food or livelihood opportunities. Humanitarian assistance needs remain high for households that have not returned and returnees that have lost their houses, uh, their homes and livelihood assets. However, in the more accessible areas of Cabo Delgado, humanitarian partners have been able to regularly distribute humanitarian food assistance to the IDPs and host communities. On the right is a map from the IOM DTM showing the type of movement flows in October, with the darker blue areas indicating areas with high IDP populations. As you can see, most IDPs are located in the northeast areas of Cabo Delgado, where attacks by the insurgents are continuing to result in displacement, the loss of livelihood assets, and limited engagement in the ongoing agricultural season. As you can see in the figure in the bottom left, the fear of attacks and increased attacks remain the key drivers for displacement. This graphic shows the number of people reported on the move by the, um, by the IOM um, each week. Um, and this is showing, uh, similarly highlighting that spikes in movement correspond to increased attacks or the fear of attacks. Moving now to some regional um, assumptions. Maize grain prices across the region are expected to remain high and increase until April, until the start of the harvest, likely in March, April period, due to the below average 2022 harvest, tightening stocks, high export demand, and volatile global commodity markets. This is also reflected in the integrated price projections, which indicate that prices are likely to remain above prices last year in the five-year average. And you can see this in the price projections above for Ranfontein on the left and Maseru in the middle. Or I'll note in Mozambique, um, prices are expected to be higher than the five-year average and higher than last year, particularly during the peak of the lean season. Looking ahead, the 2022-2023 rainy season Forecast indicates that there is a greater probability for average to above average rainfall, most, like, uh, most likely across much of the region, particularly in the southern area. In the northern parts of the region, typically this is an area that is a climatological transition zone between eastern and southern Africa. There is a greater probability for below average rainfall from October to January, but it is forecast to, to, to transition to average in early 2023. If the forecast comes to fruition, this would be the third consecutive good season in the region. Also, between December 2022 and March 2023, there is increased likelihood of an average number of cyclone strikes in Madagascar and Mozambique. <clears throat> Although the start of the rainy season in Southern Africa has been mixed, planting conditions remain generally favorable throughout the subregion, as seen on the map on the right, um, which is showing um, widespread uh, favorable conditions as highlighted by the green that you see. However, there is concern in parts of Angola due to early season dryness as indicated by the yellow. In general, the favorable rainfall will improve cropping and livestock conditions across much of the reg region. Our cultural labor will likely seasonally increase as well. Um, and this will improve agricultural labor opportunities for poor houses for poor households, although wages may be near to below average due to low liquidity from better off households. Nevertheless, access to income will help poor and very poor households access staple foods on the market. 
Food prices are anticipated to remain elevated amid the high and increasing international food prices and in general, um, weaker and unstable economies. And uh, lastly, access to income and food are also likely to be disrupted in conflict affected areas of Mozambique and the DRC. Looking at the projected food security outcomes across the region, uh, crisis IPC phase three outcomes, as indicated by the orange, are likely in areas affected by weather shocks during the 2021-2022 season, such as in southern Mozambique, um, much of Zimbabwe, southern Malawi, along with areas affected by conflict in eastern DRC and northern Mozambique. Um, however, in areas where current or programmed humanitarian assistance is filling, um, is, is providing support, stressed exclamation point IPC phase two and crisis exclamation point IPC phase three outcomes are likely as seen in Cabo Delgado, um, Mozambique, and in southwestern Madagascar. Additionally, in Lesotho and Angola, the two remote monitoring countries in the region, crisis IPC phase three outcomes are likely, uh, are likely the worst area level classification within that country. Looking ahead to February to May, regional outcomes are likely to remain similar to the October 2022 to January 2023 period until the start of the harvest around April 2023. Food security outcomes are then expected to improve with households consuming food from their own production. This will likely drive stressed IPC phase two outcomes during the harvest period as high prices will continue to impact household purchasing power. However, in southwestern Madagascar, emergency IPC, IPC phase four outcomes are most likely in 2023 in the absence of humanitarian assistance. Overall, areas of highest concern include southwestern Madagascar, conflict affected areas of the DRC and Mozambique, and weather shocked areas across the region, such as Zimbabwe, southern Malawi, and southern Mozambique. I'll now hand the presentation over to Mikhail. Hi everyone, I'm Mikhail Tesfasilase. I'll be presenting on Malawi. A quick reminder on where we are in the seasonal calendar for Malawi. Currently, the rainy season is ongoing with the winter harvest of maize, rice, beans, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, and some other vegetable uh, crops. Additionally, households are planting for the main 22-23 agricultural season, which will be harvested in 2023. Overall, in 2022, Malawi uh, has faced a number of shocks that has impacted the agricultural production and macroeconomic situation. In early 2022, Tropical Storm Anna and Tropical Depression of Gombe resulted in a widespread flooding and loss of crops in southern Malawi. Many households were unable to replant due to the loss of livelihood assets. Rapid rise in a global commodity prices due to the war in Ukraine. In addition to that, tobacco, the key export crop for Malawi, recorded a poor harvest. Lastly, there has been an erratic start to the rains in the northern and southern Malawi, which is delaying planting and limiting household access to income. In Malawi, tobacco accounts for 55% of total exporters and is one of the largest source of income. On the right is a map highlighting average household tobacco production per kg in Malawi. As you can see, most tobacco is grown in a central and northern Malawi. Understanding how important tobacco is, looking at the livelihood profile, we can see that it's primarily middle and better of householders who earn income from tobacco sales, as you can see in the far left graphic. However, very poor and poor householders primarily earn income from agricultural labor as shown in the graphic in the middle. Given that tobacco production in 2022 was 43% below the five-year average, indicates that middle and better of households earned well below normal income from the key cash crop, which is likely to impact their liquidity 
while agricultural labor and wage for very poor and poor households are also below normal level. Relatedly, many very poor and poor households in Malawi typically only grow enough food for up to 50% of their annual caloric needs and often purchase maize from the market. This can be seen here using a livelihood data for livelihood zone 05 in southern Malawi. On the far left is percent of annual kilocaloric needs made from on crop production, indicating that households are reliant on market purchases to meet their food needs. While the middle figure demonstrates that households primarily purchase maize grains. In areas like livelihood zone 05, which recorded a poor harvest following damage to crops by the storms in early 2022, households are likely even more reliant on income from agricultural labor for food purchases. Nationally, maize production was lower in 2022 than the pumper harvest in 2021, but higher than the five-year average. However, in southern Malawi, the harvest was below average due to significant crop losses from the storms. Many very poor and poor households in the affected areas reported low to negligible cereal and cash crop harvests from the main harvest ending in August. Households registered lower food production, reduced income from crop sales, and also declines in agricultural labor income. The government reported that the total maize stock will be above national requirements with the Agricultural Development and Market Cooperative and the National Food Reserve Agency reporting having close to 500,000 metric tons of maize for humanitarian assistance and subsidized commercial sales. Although the maize production is above national requirements, Malawi is facing high inflation caused due to weaker export incomes and particularly following the poor tobacco harvest. The high global food and fuel prices and further devaluation of Malawi kwacha in May 22, which contributes to limiting access to food for both rural and urban population. Additionally, the global market drop of tobacco results in further economic instability, along with limited loans or grants from international partners, fueling high inflation and raising the cost of living for many poor and very poor householders. Overall income earned was 25% below the five-year average. This also limits the government access to foreign currency to import basic necessities like processed food, fuel, and fertilizer. As you can see on the graph on the right, national food and non-food inflation rates have risen steeply from 10% in 2021 to 27% in October 2022. Additionally, the devaluation of Malawi kwacha is resulting in imported items to be more expensive in local currency. The National Statistics Office report particularly highlighting that food inflation is about 35% directly affecting many poor families who typically purchase around 50% of their food from market. Staple food price, mainly maize, are higher than last year and the five-year average in rural and urban areas. Households have been losing their purchasing power due to high inflation and lower employment opportunities or lower income, which has led to reduced access to food. In October 2022, maize prices trended 162% above last year and 132% above the five-year average. As you can see on the graph on the right, with the blue bars showing the price of maize and the orange lines showing percentage of the five-year average. The main drivers for the higher prices includes reduced crop production in the south, 
prolonged closure of the agricultural development market in cooperative markets that sell subsidized food, the high inflation, macroeconomic challenges, and above average informal exports to neighboring countries. Urban cost of living for basic needs was 160% higher than in, in August 2021, as per the report from the Center for Social Concern Urban. The high cost of living is weakening household purchasing power and limiting household access to food. At the same time, limited agricultural labor opportunities are currently available given the erratic start of the 22-23 rainy season. And that causes middle and better of householders to limit their areas planted due to the high cost of agricultural input. Looking ahead um, to describe the assumptions we set, even though the national stocks are sufficient, high prices will persist due to macroeconomic challenges, high inflation and devaluation of currency. Average rainfall during the crop season is expected, but irregular weather could lead to localized below average production for a third consecutive time in southern Malawi. Average income from agricultural labor, but wage rates are likely to be lower than normal due to less demand for agricultural labor. The humanitarian assistance uh, is expected to start in November, in, mainly in central and southern Malawi, uh, and it will cover between 25 and 50 percent of their kilocaloric needs. And the assistance will stay between three and five months during the lean season. The graph on the right shows uh, projections of maize prices trending higher than last year and five year average. Looking at the most likely food security outcomes, an increasing number of poor and very poor householders will more heavily rely on market to access basic food items as households food stock dwindle between October and January. Given the high food prices, inflation, and the poor harvest in southern Malawi, crisis or IPC phase three outcomes are likely in southern Malawi from October to January. Households will likely remain dependent on market until the commencement of 22-23 harvest in March or April. Looking to February to May period, the start of humanitarian food assistance in some districts as of November will drive stressed exclamation mark or IPC phase two exclamation mark outcomes, particularly in far south and parts of Lilongwe, where minimal IPC phase one and stressed exclamation mark or IPC phase two exclamation outcomes are likely. However, in areas where food assistance deliveries will either begin late or will not be sustained until March, the outstanding factors such as poor purchasing power, depletion of food stocks, reduced crop yields are still expected to result in crisis or IPC phase three outcomes. Finally, the increasing cost of living is expected to exert additional pressure on limiting access to food among urban householders. Near normal income is expected mainly from employment, trading, and services for urban householders. An increase in the number of stressed IPC phase two households is expected in cities such as Lilongwe and Blantyre which households applying coping strategies like consuming less nutritious substitutes and reducing the numbers of meals eaten daily. I will now hand the presentation to my colleague, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks, Mikhail. Uh, Benjo, you can go ahead to the next slide. So I'll start off first with Madagascar's seasonal calendar, and I'm focusing in on southern Madagascar, which is our area of highest concern for the country. And you can see their seasonal calendar here at the bottom of the slide. So by October, the cassava harvests have normally finished and planting for the main agricultural season will be beginning in some areas, but that does extend all the way through January. Peak labor demand for cash crops will continue through the end of the year, 
And although this is normally conducted in northern and central parts of Madagascar, it is typically an important source of income for households in the Grand South who would normally seasonally migrate for these harvests. The lean season normally starts towards the end of the year, but as I'll be getting into here shortly, this year the lean season in the Grand South started atypically early in about September. It'll last until green harvests begin in about February or March, and then full harvests will begin around March or April. Next slide, please. So as my colleagues have mentioned, there's been a number of shocks around the region and Madagascar is experiencing the same thing this year. So severe drought conditions developed during this year's rainfall season and it marked the third consecutive drought in southern Madagascar, as well as the sixth poor rainfall season out of the past seven years. So on the left of the slide, you can see how low cumulative rainfall was between December of last year through February of this year across southwestern Madagascar. And in the middle of the slide, I've pulled out the observed rainfall for Toliara in the southwest, just so you can see those trends a little bit better. So the graph on the top is showing how erratic rainfall was, where the green line is the 2021 to 22 observed rainfall compared against the red line as the average. And then below that, the same lines are graphed to show cumulative rainfall. And you can see just how far below normal rainfall um, turned out to be by the end of the season. Again, the green line being the 2021 to 22 year compared to the red line being the average. And then on the right of the slide, we're seeing the paths of several of the six different tropical storms and cyclones to hit the island earlier this year. These caused flooding and considerable crop and infrastructure damage in localized areas in both the east and the north. And as a result, households in the Grand South have significantly below average food stocks going into the annual lean season. So this year, the production of maize and legumes was between 60 and 70% below average, with those southwestern areas the most heavily impacted. And after the rainfall season was over, we saw a really serious continuation of poor soil moisture conditions across the Southwest. And this negatively impacted the development of root and tuber crops and resulted in below average production of both cassava and sweet potato. Some areas reportedly had little to no stocks following the seasonal harvest from August to October and worst affected areas reported up to 30% of households experiencing total crop failure. So this triggered, as I mentioned before, an atypical early start to the annual lean season, as households have had to rely on market purchase much earlier than usual in the year. Next slide, please. With cyclone damage this year, there's been a reduction in the demand for cash crop labor, and this combined with well above average uh, transportation costs has been limiting poor households in the Grand South in their ability to engage in typical seasonal migration. We also have reports of a small portion of households in worse affected areas saying that they're preferring to temporarily migrate to areas where they understand access to humanitarian assistance is higher instead of carrying out typical seasonal labor migration. But for most households in the region, they're relying this year more on local income generating activities. Those include firewood and charcoal sales, fetching and selling water, which you can see in the photo here on the right, making and selling rope and other products from the sisal plant, as well as some local mining opportunities. But income earned from these activities is much lower than normal this year, given an oversupply because there's an atypically high number of households trying to earn their income this way, and then really low demand because households have limited disposable income across the region. Some households are starting to earn income from land preparation activities in the lead up to the main agricultural season, but this income source is also below average given that consecutive years of drought as well as high inflation and overall economic decline have been reducing better off households' ability to hire labor. Households are increasingly engaging in the gathering and selling of wild foods, but again, those droughts have caused negative impact to their availability, and there is a significant increase in competition for those plants this year. I would also note that well below average pasture conditions have been significantly deteriorating livestock body conditions. You can see an example of this in the photo here on the left, and we have reports of pastoralists prematurely selling their livestock out of concerns that their herds will die due to drought or disease, and they're just preferring to receive some income from their sales 
even if at depressed prices. So this is also contributing to a significant reduction in livestock herd sizes. Next slide. Now I'll briefly turn to the economic situation in the country, which has been deteriorating from high international prices and a negative trade balance, which are both contributing to rising inflation. We did see a deceleration in inflation from July of last year to June of this year, but headline inflation has been rising again since July, which you can see in the graph here on the left. These inflationary pressures are weighing on household incomes and reducing purchasing power, but they're also affecting the ability of better off households to be able to hire labor, which in turn constrains labor opportunities for poorer households. And although we did see near average national level harvest this year, prices of most commodities are above last year's level and the five-year average due to general inflation, above average transportation costs, and high global prices for goods that are imported. FuseNet data shows price increases across all commodities and markets. And an example of this is in Ampani in the Grand South. In October, dried cassava prices rose 8% month on month due to significantly below average cassava harvest this year. And in October, prices were also 18% above last year and 51% above the five-year average. You can see that in the graph here on the right where the black line represents this year's prices, the blue line represents last year's prices, and the gray bars represent the five-year average. Next slide. Perfect. So on this slide, you can see the planned humanitarian assistance levels across the Grand South from April through October. And what I want to note here is just how high assistance has remained even in these post-harvest months, given the atypical needs this year. We do want to note, though, that there were reports from the field indicating that there were earlier delays in delivery between about March and May, and that resulted in food assistance, which was slated to end in June. You can see those drops between May and July in the graph here. That assistance actually continued in some areas through August because of those earlier delays. So once this assistance dropped off, uh, we had reports of food consumption gaps beginning to increase in those affected districts. But by early to mid-October, planned assistance had resumed, and it's our assessment that it is currently mitigating worse outcomes in areas where it is highest, including in Bikili, Ambusari, Ampani, and Betwiki. Next slide. So looking ahead to May of next year, we have here a few of our key assumptions. So in western parts of the Grand South, poor soil moisture conditions are likely going to negatively impact the establishment of maize and other cereals at the beginning of the main agricultural season. But average rainfall from November to April is expected to improve those conditions to about normal early in next year, and that will allow for normal crop development for the remainder of the growing season. You can see that here in the graphic on the right, which is showing generally positive conditions for maize across almost all of the Grand South. We're also expecting an average number of cyclones this year. An average cropped area for cassava and rice is expected to lead to average and national level production, but some limited access to agricultural inputs will lead to below average production of both cassava and maize in the Grand South. In eastern and some northern parts of the country, below average production of cash crops is likely, and even though we do expect some recovery in the sector into next year, high input prices will constrain investment and keep next year's harvest expectations somewhat below average. In terms of market and stable food prices, um, markets are expected to remain supplied at normal levels across the country, except for in the Grand South. And in the Grand South, rainfall is likely to deteriorate road conditions, and this may temporarily sever some linkages to markets and reduce the number of traders through about March. This could result in delivery delays, supply shortages, and additional price spikes in affected areas. Prices of locally produced staples are expected to remain above average across the country, and they'll remain significantly above average in the Grand South through the peak of the lean season, as inflation is respect expected to remain high. Next slide. Agricultural labor demand for cash crops will likely be below average, and local agricultural labor opportunities, particularly in the Grand South, are expected to increase with the beginning of the main agricultural season, but then remain well below average given better off households reduced capacity to hire labor. 
both agricultural and non-agricultural wage rates are expected to remain below average. In the Grand South, particularly in the Southwest, livestock body conditions are likely to deteriorate further and livestock deaths are expected to increase until early 2023 when rainfall can begin to regenerate enough pasture. Both pasture availability and livestock body conditions are expected to improve thereafter, but they'll still remain at below normal levels, mostly given the severity of conditions as we go into this year's rainy season. So given those below average body conditions and early sales, livestock prices and income from livestock sales are still expected to remain below average throughout the outlook period. The availability of wild foods, such as the cactus fruit shown here on the right, is expected to be below average in the Grand South following multiple consecutive droughts and the resulting overexploitation of forests as poor households have relied at an atypically high level on wild foods to reduce their consumption deficits in recent years. Lastly, humanitarian assistance across the Grand South is expected to expand in some areas and continue at similar levels in other. And we expect that this will mitigate acute food insecurity outcomes in the areas where assistance is highest, including in Bikili, Baloa, Chihombe, Ampani, and Medongiatsimo. And although assistance is planned to continue through the lean season, we understand from WFP it's currently only funded through January, which would make it unlikely to occur at the peak of the lean season. Next slide, please. All right, so taking a look now at what our most likely food security outcomes are for October to January that are shown here on the left, and then for February to May, which are shown here on the right, we'll start first in the Grand Southeast, where some negative impacts from this year's shocks are likely going to be at least partially mitigated in some areas by the inflows of humanitarian food assistance through January. Many households are likely to be highly dependent on markets and humanitarian assistance in order to access food, but they'll still be unable to meet uh, their non-food expenditures, and this will result in stressed or stressed exclamation point outcomes. In the absence of humanitarian assistance, crisis outcomes are likely to emerge in parts of the Grand Southeast by February, by February, excuse me, uh, along with the peak of the lean season. And then turning to southwestern Madagascar, households are heavily reliant in this region on humanitarian assistance to meet their food needs. Despite this year's anticipated average rains, households are really facing high consumption for agricultural labor, I'm sorry, high competition for agricultural labor, low wages, and anticipated below average cropped area given below average access to seed. Worst affected households are likely to reduce the quantity of food eaten per meal or reduce the number of meals eaten per day. And in some cases, household members are likely to skip multiple meals up to two to three times per week and to resort to consuming wild foods such as cactus fruits and leaves, raw mangoes or tamarind fruits mixed with ash in order to reduce widening consumption gaps. Households have really increasingly limited consumption, co I'm sorry, livelihood coping strategies that they're able to turn to. And this includes increasing reliance on water fetching and selling, informal mining, atypical migration, charcoal and wild food selling, and the sales of productive and non-productive assets. So with all that said, at the peak of the lean season between February and March, and again, in the absence of humanitarian assistance, we do expect that poorer households in the Southwest will likely face emergency outcomes, which you can see here in the red areas marked in the map on the right. So with that, I will hand it back over to Benja to conclude. Thanks, Elizabeth. That concludes our presentation. Um, here's just a reminder of the projected food security outcomes across the region for the outlook period, and we will now take any questions. Thank you.